Okay, next topic. How do we connect color to data? Do you remember the weather condition prediction map with the disastrous colors from last time? <laughs> this example is equally difficult to decode just looking at the map itself. There does seem to be a connection between the blues um, and because of the proximity, it seems like there should be a connection between the blue, green, and pink. But look at the legend. The map shows measurements of something ranging from a low of a half of an inch in pink, moving through green, blue, purple, to a high of over 120 inches in deep red. So pink and red are very clearly related to one another, and yet they represent opposite ends of the spectrum of what's being represented here. Pink doesn't make any sense as the color for the low end. It's much more similar a color to the colors representing the highest values. There does seem to be a graduation from green to blue to purple, um, but intuitively we don't know which one equals more. You know, is green more than blue? Is blue more than green? We don't know without the legend. So there's, there's that loss of, of pre-attention, right? Um, yeah, overall, just poor use of color. Yeah, so let, let's look at different types of color graduations or schemes and talk about how to use them more effectively. Okay, first, first we need to make it clear that the type of color scheme needs to be driven by the type of data that you have. Nominal colors, what I would call random colors, are appropriate for nominal or categorical data. Data that doesn't have a rank, just names or categories like states or type of vegetable. Sequential schemes vary from one color clearly to another. It doesn't have to be monochromatic and can be um, shades of one color or it can go from you know yellow to green or something like that. Um, sequential color schemes should be used for rankable categories, low, medium, high, um, or numeric data that's continuous like population density, emission totals, you know, total rainfall or something like that. Diverging color schemes have a neutral mid-color. These should only be used when your data has a natural midpoint. It doesn't necessarily have to be zero with positive and negatives. It could be like a national average and you want to display, you know, which counties fall above or below the national mean. Um, yeah, so anything that has a meaningful mid value, you should use uh, diverging color schemes to draw our attention to the differences. Yeah, okay. Qualitative or categorical colors. What makes these um, successful is that each color is perceptually very different from one another. So these are three different um, names of um, color schemes, qualitative, nominal, categorical color schemes. Um, they're also, in addition to being easy to distinguish from one another, they're kind of equally perceived. They're equally um, dark or intense against the background, maybe with the exception of this really light yellow one here is, is its luminosity, and we'll talk about that in a second. The luminosity is a little bit low on this one. Um, the beautiful thing about Okabe Ito is that it's colorblind safe. I'll show you some examples. I took a screenshot of these three color schemes and put them into um, this colorblindness simulator it's an online website. You just upload a file so you can take your graphs. Um, there's also apps you can put on your camera or on your phone where you look through your camera lens and it converts everything you're seeing. It simulates different color blindness. Um, so you could, you could test your graphs that way too. So here I've got it set up for red blind uh, color blindness. And here's that Okabe Ito. You can see that even if you aren't able to perceive um, the red wavelengths, you still have um, distinguishable colors. Um, the Color Brewer and ggplot fall down a little bit. And you can kind of tell these apart. These are, are nearly indistinguishable. And I would say that these two are nearly indistinguishable as well. But Okabe Ito does a really nice job. And then here is uh, green. Color blindness, again, Okabe Ito coming out on top with um, seven completely distinct colors uh, where Color Brewer and Gigi Plot um, fall short, I think. 
So, I mean, that's seven classes, though, right? You could get rid of, you could go down to six classes and then have um, really distinguishable colors there. All right, so here's an example of when you might use qualitative colors, nominal, categorical. This is a graph showing the percent of population growth from 2000 to 2010 in the U.S. States are arranged in order of their population growth over that period of time and are colored by geographic region. So this kind of coloring highlights that states in the same region have experiment, uh, experienced similar population growth, but sta like states in the west and southwest Southwest have seen the largest population increases, but there's no rank here. There's nothing implied. There's nothing sequential about these. They're just just different areas. Okay, sequential. Um, like I was saying, you could have monochromatic sequential color ramps and um, yeah, I don't know what you'd call these, multi-hued maybe, where you're going from a yellowish to red. Um, yeah, I guess what you want to do here is just be aware that if you, um, you're going to start imparting some bias because the lighter colors have low contrast against the base map, or if you had a black or a dark colored um, background or base map, um, these guys would have the highest contrast. And so what happens here is you end up drawing attention to the areas that have either the more intense color or the highest contrast with whatever's around them. So you have to be a little bit careful. But again, these should be used for um, quantities and um, ordinal type of data like small, medium, large. Yeah, and then, yeah, I guess this is a multi-hue here. Okay. So like I was saying, because of the white background and the white borders, the dark blue counties are the ones that are draw drawing our attention the most. Um, it's good, yeah, well, anyway, it's just something to be aware of. Representing data values with colors is particularly useful and we want to show how the values vary spatially. So this, you know, is called a choropleth map and it's showing annual mean income within each county in Texas sequentially. So just increasing values, increasing in intensity of color. Um, sequential color ramps are appropriate when the color increases in intensity as the value increases. Just like I said. Okay, divergent color ramps. Um, you can think of these as two sequential scales stitched together at this common um, neutral midpoint color. Um, you need to be a little bit careful if this neutral color um, tends to lean more one way than the other. Like I think this color is fairly white. It's a little pinkish to me. This one is truly gray, um, but it might be seen as cooler and might imply a like a connection with the blue end. This is clearly a warm color to me and um, to me groups with the brown end of the scale. Um, I don't see the same connection between these two colors. So you may be overrepresenting representing um, this side of the scale and not really remaining neutral. So be a little bit aware of that too. Um, I think the other thing you need to be aware of is not to impart bias. Be aware of the intuitive meanings of colors. I'll show you some examples of that in a minute, but um, yeah, I think, you know, we, we the good, bad, uh, Republican, Democrat, you just need to be careful. Um, this can be perceived as wet and dry. So I think you just have to be careful about the colors that you choose. Okay, moving on. So here's another map of uh, Texas counties. This time though, notice that the values are the percent of the county's population that identifies as white. The value ranges from zero to 100%. So that's a sequential ordering and you could use a sequential color ramp here. But the authors wanted their message to be about which counties are um, identifying as majority or minority white. So 50% um, was a meaningful, um, middle ground or, or break value there. And that's why they went with the divergent color ramp. It makes it really easy to see which counties um, identify primarily as white, uh, which are prim primarily um, identifying as minority, and where there's an equal number, equal proportions. It's a really effective tool. Okay, some general rules of thumb. 
the value or how light or dark something is and the intensity, these are perceived as ordered. So be careful to use these for continuous numeric values or ordinal data. Hue or color is typically perceived as unordered. So you're going to use this to encode, no to encode nominal data, state names, um, territories, types of things. Use color to clarify. So how can we make our plots better using color? We can, number one, not just randomly color things because we can. This would be more effective if it was just all one consistent color. But if you're going to use color, um, leverage intuition. You know, color the bars to relate to what the fruit is. It's just kind of a simple, a simple um, example. Okay, you can use saturation or intensity to focus your viewer's eye on the main point of your map. Um, this, is the, um, this is a plot about the Simpsons, 25 seasons of the Simpsons, the number of episodes in orange, um, viewers of the most popular episode in millions, average viewers per episode in millions, and the number of awards they won per season. Well, if, you're, if your plot is trying to focus on the trend of the average number of viewers per episode decreasing over time, you can desaturate or fade the other lines and then use full saturation or intensity for the data that you're um, wanting your, your viewers to focus on. Okay, another thing we can do is use that intuition, um, the feeling that we get from colors to try and send a message. This is a, a dashboard created by British Petroleum who's clearly trying to brand themselves as an eco-friendly organization. Look at that beautiful flower, sunshine. It's so green and healthy and lush. Okay, improving data graphics with color. Another way we can use color is just to add more data. We can add more dimensions of data. This is a plot. It's actually really a map. Because if you look here, you'll see it's an X and Y position of the strike zone locations of 287 pitches thrown by a major league pitcher in 2008. Okay, so if we had just these two dimensions of data to describe the X and Y locations in the strike zone, one color is going to be sufficient. And here it's been drawn with um, unfilled little rectangles so you can get a sense where they start to overlap and see a density. What if we want to know more though? What if, for instance, um, there, we had information about the type of pitch, like a curveball or a fastball. How could we add that new information? Well, we could add different symbols. So we could use the same map, but then just encode the type of throw it was um, using different symbols. We could use multiple graphs, or we could add color. So let's mess around with this a little bit. Okay. So here's, here's a, an example where we just changed up the symbology a little bit. And I agree with the ghost, that's pretty bad. Um, yeah, glyphs, glyphs like this are, are really tough to decode. Um, it makes our head hurt a little bit because distinguishing the little symbols demands so much attention versus what we now know is pre-attentively processed cues like color um, even after we've visually decoded the symbols and kind of mapped the groups in our head, we still have to pop back and forth up to the, the legend to understand kind of what the symbols are representing. So big cognitive load equals bad visualizing. But what if we try multiples? I think this is fairly successful. We've got clear labels of what type of pitch it is, and we've just pulled them out to see um, that, you know, Oscar throws his fastballs really low and his sliders high. It's easy to see the pattern there. Um, what if we wa want to add information about ball speed in there? We can add color. So we're just building on that, this idea of multiples and throwing in um, a legend encoding with color. And it makes sense that our fastball is on the higher end um, sliders, you can see, tend to be toward the lower end. There's a lot of variation in the changeup, which makes sense. And sinkers tend to be pretty fast. That's interesting. Um, 
yeah, what's good here is that this, we're still using a, this is a divergent color ramp, but the palette, um, th there must be some meaning, I guess, between 78 miles per hour. Maybe it's the average ball speed. It doesn't seem like it's the average, unless some of them are just really slow. Um, I'm not sure, but the luminosity, meaning if you stripped the color out of this, um, they're all equally dark um, in value, which means they all show up equally against the white background. So we're not putting any kind of bias and drawing our attention to the extremes here. It's, they're all kind of treated equally. We're just desaturating toward a uh, neutral color in the middle. Okay, so color choice. Remember, data needs to drive the color scheme, but we can't ignore intuition and convention. Like on maps, blue equals water, period. Green is usually representing some kind of natural area. Red is used for heat, threat, danger. Um, the challenge comes in trying to find colors that don't unknowingly imply some relationship or connection, right? So if you use two types of red for two different types of features, they might appear related and even ordered. So you have to be careful, but you can use it to your advantage too. You can use a single color for roads, for example, but vary the lightness to communicate whether it's a major or minor road. So remember, color can cause your audience to see groups, order, and patterns, whether you intend them or not. So use color carefully to ensure a clear map or graphic message. Okay, that's it, thanks.